You are listening to the Visualising War podcast. In each episode, we talk about representations of war in art, text, film and music. With new guests each time, we look at how people have described or imagined war in different periods and places, and we discuss the impact which war stories have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Nicholas Vieter. And my name is Alice Koenig. And we co-direct the Visualising War project at the University of St Andrews. Today's podcast is the follow-up to our interview a couple of weeks ago with curators at the Imperial War Museum who have been thinking about how to update and represent well-known wars to museum visitors in the 21st century. The Imperial War Museum's new Second World War and Holocaust galleries open to the public today, so we're focusing our attention on them in this episode. And we have three people with us who were heavily involved in their design to discuss the decisions they took about what aspects of conflict they wanted to foreground and what they hope visitors will take away. Vicky Hawkins, Kate Clemens and James Bulgen. Thank you for making time to talk to us today and welcome to the Visualizing War podcast. Hello. Hello. Hi. Nice to Hello. be here. Thank you. Vicky, maybe we can start with you. Could you uh, kick us off by telling us a bit more about what the old World War II galleries were like and uh, what did they focus on and how did they encourage visitors to visualize World War II? Yes, of course. So the last time the IWM had large scale Second World War galleries was in the 1990s. And they very much drew out events that lay closest to home for Britain and the Commonwealth. So the footprint given over to showcases relating to things like the Blitz and the Battle of Britain was probably about the same as the total entire campaign in the Pacific or the war on the Eastern Front. And that was partly due to the fact that the emphasis had been on the British experience and that has dominated historical collecting as, as well as display, uh, creating an imbalance in the cultural material and memory held by IWM. Now we have a fantastic collection of material from the Blitz and the British experience in Burma or prisoners of war in Asia, but in those previous galleries, content relating to and objects relating to China or the Soviet Union was so limited or in many cases, completely non-existent. So this is something that we really wanted to address in the rebalancing of our narrative for the new Second World Gallery, World War Galleries, to ensure that we're putting that British experience of war back into a wider global context. So that's very interesting, this rebalancing of the previous exhibition. So Kate, if we can come to you, it would just be interesting to hear a little bit more about what prompted the decision to update the Second World War galleries, create new ones 30 years on from the ones that had been set up in the 1990s. Maybe you can tell us a bit about what prompted that, but also, you know, what the process has been and how long it has taken you to get to opening day today. Yeah, as you say, it's been about 30 years since IWM last developed a permanent exhibition about the Second World War at its London site. So basically new displays were due, really, you know, um, things move on, uh, maybe understanding and learning moves on, and we need to reflect that. So um, these new galleries, they're part of a wider master plan to transform IWM London, which began with a new atrium space and First World War galleries in 2014. And we also wanted to refresh the focus and the narrative of the Second World War displays, as Vicky was mentioning, you know, to position IWM's traditional remit of Britain and its empire within a broader global context. So thereby making the story of the Second World War more relevant, really, to 21st century visitors. You know, our process for this began a few years ago and Vicky and I joined the project back in 2016 now. And we've worked since then to shape, you know, the content and the design and the narrative of the galleries. So I guess you could say what prompted this rethinking is the broader discourse about how we think about our role in the world and the, the whole question about empire that's implied in the Imperial War Museum and moving towards this global perspective. James, you've been involved alongside Vicky and Kate in designing the brand new Holocaust Gallery, which also opens today. Could you tell us a bit more about the brief behind that gallery and what place it has in the uh, wider Imperial War Museum? The Imperial War Museum opened its first Holocaust exhibition in, in 2000. And that was in and of itself quite a significant moment for the museum because it's not something which had been represented as a kind of discrete part of the museum's broader narrative previously. And it was, a, you know, not just a big moment for the organisation, but also for the country because, it's, you know, this is centralising this memory as a, as a kind of a European memory rather than just something which is German focused, I suppose. So that exhibition was a bold move for the, for the organisation at the time for a variety of different reasons. But now 20 years down the line, of course, the Holocaust has evolved really substantially in respect of historiography. And it was clearly the right time to reappraise the narrative that we were telling and the way that we were telling it. 
critically for us as an organization, it also gave us an opportunity to position the Holocaust within the broader history of the Second World War. So to talk about it as a contingent history, I think there's been quite a, a substantial concern amongst the Holocaust historians for some time now that the Holocaust has been really decontextualized in the public consciousness and the collective memory, to the extent that some scholars have described it as a free-floating event uncoupled from history. So what we've tried to do is to look at the, the main factors of the evolution of Holocaust historiography, to integrate that into our new approach, to find new ways of relating to the story rather than kind of relying on, on some of the, the modes which have been used quite predominantly across institutions, both in this country and internationally, and trying to make sure that our visitors understand this is contextualised, meaningfully contextualised history. So that's what we've sought to do. I found this a really interesting approach. I mean, I'm German originally, so then that was precisely how this period was taught at school. You know, on the one hand, you would learn about the events of the war. On the other hand, you would learn about the Holocaust. But it was actually never really quite made clear how these two are interlinked and related. So I, I personally, you know, find this a, a very interesting and promising approach. And what I'm getting out of the responses so far is that a big thing is really thinking about context and rethinking about context and recontextualizing events and things in the museum. I mean, I think that's true. And I, I think that the Second World War and the Holocaust, both in different ways, experience the same challenge in terms of public understanding, in which both of them have kind of been reconceived in, in very kind of singular terms. You know, the Holocaust is, you know, routinely deployed as this kind of quote unquote ultimate trauma drama, the sort of the ethical limit case of, of what Western society is capable of. And that process of mythologization is you know highly reductive removes all of its kind of historic detail but also it's its complexity and i think probably i mean the case and vicky could be much more authoritatively on it but i think probably a similar thing is with the second world war too that certain ideas have become really dominant and have precluded you know the, the vast complexity of the other things which existed alongside it yeah and of course presumably in their own way the imperial war museums have at times helped to establish new habits of visualizing these very 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 well known conflicts but it's really interesting to see you going back to them on what seems like a quite regular cycle you know 20 years 30 years and so on catching up with the research bringing all of that to bear catching up with the current contemporary context and so on and, and looking at it all again and then challenging these established habits of visualizing the second world war or the holocaust holocaust looking at their contingency and so on. So we'll come back to the Holocaust galleries in a minute, but first it would be really good if we could get a flavor of the visitor experience, which today visitors are actually able to experience in person in the new World War II galleries. So Vicky, can you tell us what big things you wanted to change about the way World War II was represented in the museum, some of your guiding principles and so on, and what this new visitor experience is like? Yes, I'd love to. Um, so within the new galleries, we've got three main guiding principles that we feel are really, really important in our reinterpretation of the narrative. First is one that we've touched on very briefly already, and that is to ensure that we put the British experience of war into this wider global context. So what we've done is we've rebalanced the narrative to give more emphasis to events and experiences of people in Asia and the Pacific, as well as the Soviet Union. And we've achieved this by including far more objects from around the globe, more film footage from other countries and um, that really brings us quite quite nicely and quite quickly onto our second principle which is it also um, a way of making a, a, the story more global is to include more global personal individual stories so personal stories are key to the new galleries using this sort of personal story approach we hope that visitors will appreciate the vast diversity of people involved and the variety of emotional and physical responses that people had to the war that varies from you know pain and suffering and loss but also resistance strength love and separation and we believe that the people featured in the galleries will provide our visitors with these connections to the past and encourage reflection on their own choices or responses to the challenges that individuals faced during the conflict there's over a hundred individual stories that are embedded throughout the narrative and in many cases they have each person has an object that belongs to the person and it's probably quite key at this moment to also say that everything within the gallery spaces is going to be be contemporaneous so that means every object every sort of diary every quote um, film footage it's all from the time and that allows us to tell stories and opinions without a sense of that inevitability of, of what's going to potentially happen in the rest of the conflict and and gives us the freedom to um, kind of give the voice back to to the people that are experiencing it at the time and the final guiding principle that we really focus on is a sense of uh, the, the idea of total war so the fact that during the Second World War, everyone, all members of society were involved in the conflict. 
And we use case studies and objects to interpret this gallery wide theme and highlight patterns of a historical event and transnational links between them. So some of these uh, total war themes that we look at include the bombing of civilians, famine, sexual violence, mobilization, occupation. And in all cases, what we do is we look at one of those themes and see how it can be represented in multiple countries and then use case studies to go into a little bit more depth to explore them further. Yeah, I think some, some of this really resonates also with uh, things that we've been talking about with other interview guests, especially this focus on individuals and this idea of moving a bit away from the big events and the battle narratives and thinking more about how war impacted societies, the people who, who lived in it, and the link with material objects. I think that's also something that we also see in other parts of the discourse about war at the moment. So that sounds really very timely to me. Kate, so Vicky has told us a bit about the principles behind the exhibition and wanted to ask you now, how does this map onto the physical space? So what is the sort of their design approach for the new galleries? The new galleries will occupy about 950 square metres of the museum space. And in terms of design approach, the Second World War is obviously a large and complex story. So we were keen to break it down really into a series of different gallery spaces to allow visitors to move through the narrative. And each gallery has a different sort of look and feel, which helps visitors to move intuitively through the different phases of the war. So it's a broadly chronological approach. And the first gallery space introduces the background to the war, sort of sets the scene of the world in the 1930s, sets up the sort of aggressive nations which were disturbing the peace and the sort of fear of total war that many people felt during this time. And this is captured in a large projected audiovisual piece that dominates the centre of the room, which is kind of on a cracked table-like surface, sort of reflecting the breaking of the First World War peace agreements. And then the second gallery follows the war as it sweeps across Europe. And there are pretty big showcases in there which surround one of the small boats from um, Dunkirk, which is quite a key object from that phase. Um, And then moving into the third gallery space, that really looks at Britain at war in 1940 to 41. Um, And a key theme there is a threat from the air. So we've got the Battle of Britain and the Blitz quite dominating. And this is reflected in the design, including a typical uh, 1940s British home that we've sort of created in the gallery space um, that's been partially destroyed in the Blitz. And that features sort of curtains and and wallpaper and a, a radio that you can tune and change the channels on. And there's also in this gallery space an atmospheric ceiling installation that captures the sights and sounds of the threat from the air which is very evocative in that gallery space. And then the fourth gallery is a really open space which aligns really well with the narrative because this is where the war turns truly global. So um, we look at North Africa and the Mediterranean, the Soviet Union, East Asia and the Pacific and the back of the Atlantic. And the design features really large screens behind the showcases, which shows recently shot footage of the different environments. For example, the North African desert, the Ukraine, the Philippines and the Atlantic Ocean. And this underlines the scale and the scope of the conflict and it lets visitors see the different climates and the terrains that the war was fought in. And then the fifth gallery, this is a pretty large space and it's where we explain how the allied nations defeated the Axis powers. And the design features colorful maps on the floor, really large maps on the gallery floor. And these correspond to areas that focus on the war in East Asia and the Pacific, Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And this is also where there is a physical link through to the Holocaust galleries above. And that's created by the display of a V1 flying bomb in between the two, um, which is a really you know, powerful moment for visitors. And then the last gallery space is where we look at the post-war world up until 1949. And it's quite a dark space. And it just underlines that although the war had ended, there was still ongoing conflict and issues that resulted from it. So it wasn't all happiness and light at this point. And central in that space is a showcase that features six very different people and their objects to show that there were a range of experiences in the post-war world. Thanks for that fantastic tour and giving us a sense of the physical space but also a sense of the learning journey I suppose that visitors take through it and I think one of the things that's really interesting me about this and and actually I think we'll pick up on this with James as well when we talk through the Holocaust galleries is this sense of storytelling and this sense of using all sorts of different senses, light, darkness, sound, sights, but also maybe interactive objects and so on in the storytelling. And I was just wondering if you could say a tiny bit more, either Kate or Vicky, about the range of visitors you're trying to engage with this. How much is this accessible to young children all the way up to, you know, adults who perhaps know 
the history of the Second World War very, very well. Shall I, shall I start, Kate? So we have a term that I really like sometimes in the, in the museum that previously we've relied on granddad's tour guides. So when family members or family groups would come to our museum, there was often a member who had either a lived experience of the conflict or closely related to it. And they would often go through our gallery spaces and point out objects that they remembered or they had interacted with or had been in their family home. But unfortunately, obviously, that, that link to the past, and those uh, number of people within living memory of the conflict is much far reduced. And so we have to find other ways to engage our visitors and provide these links for them. And the personal stories that we've talked about is certainly one of them. But we've also got some interactive elements within the gallery spaces. Uh, there is one looking at Enigma and the decoding process, we have one on journalism and the effects of changing the news story depending on the language and the imagery used. That one specifically looking at Dunkirk and whether or not it was reported as a, a disaster or a triumph. And we also have a war artist activity where visitors can scroll through looking at a variety of official war art, not just from Britain, but Japan, from Germany, also from Nigeria and Kenya. So there's a huge different diverse way that visitors can learn, be that a young child or an adult or a family group and essentially our job as curators is to provide ways to inspire conversation and debate between family members so that they can have those discussions that's essentially what we hope to achieve so that we hope that through the variety of different methods that we present to them digital AVs these hands-on interactives personal stories where you might be able to identify with the thoughts and the feelings and the reactions of of the people that we're describing that we provide multiple options for um, a multiple ways to interpret the history. It's very interesting that you're talking about having people identify with things because I think one of the things that I'm picking out from your descriptions here is the importance of of helping people connect and empathize I suppose as they go through the galleries and I guess individual objects play a very important role in that and in one of your guiding principles in particular this sort of diversity of personal experience and so I wonder if we could look at some individual objects now. Maybe Vicky, you can kick us off and just tell us about one of your favourite objects that perhaps illustrates the approach that you've taken to the galleries more generally. Yes, certainly. So one of the objects that I think really does um, echo a lot of the themes that we've spoken about already is a shelter admissions ticket from Chongqing, the wartime capital of China. Now, it's quite a, a small object, a small paper with red characters on it, and it's been translated by a historian for us. And it's absolutely fantastic because when you read through the content, a lot of the, the words and the saying and the phrases are very similar to the kind of phrases that were present in a, the British experience of bombing of civilians. So the shelter ticket asks people to pay attention to coming in and out of the shelter and staying quiet and keeping calm and respecting others inside. But then also has some of those other links that are specific to maybe the areas of Chongqing. So it says it's recommended to bring a fan and a towel into the shelter with you. And that's because the shelters in Chongqing were built into the rock and could become very hot but also in some places were very cool so it's interesting because IWM holds a huge amount of material culture which records experiences of the blitz in Britain and these are very recognizable objects to many of our visitors and have the capacity to invoke memory and and carry embodied meaning and encourage those international or intergenerational discussions between our visitors and so by displaying the air raid ticket from Chongqing, from China, and also alongside images of people and places affected by bombing in various different countries, we are able to place a sort of marginalised aspect of the Second World War within a prominent public space that's deliberately establishing parallels with the better known British experience. So as well as looking at the bombing of Britain and the bombing of Chongqing, we also have objects that include a, a German civilian fireman's jacket, a German air raid precautions medical case that would have been used on the scene of bombing. And we also have blackout propaganda from other countries. There's a section looking at the bombing of Japan and a flag that indicates the site of the closest water supply, which will be used to reflect the air raid precautions there. So we hope that this, this shelter ticket actually, although it's a small object, it has so much huge meaning behind it and we'll hope to give our visitors connections between maybe an aspect of the Second World War that they are comfortable or familiar with and encourage them to think about it from a different perspective, in this case, from the perspective of China. And we're not trying to say that 
every country had an exact same experience of bombing, of total war. But we're just trying to show that there are connections and that there are some shared experiences, although individually it was very diverse. Could I just follow up on this a little bit and maybe also ask Kate about the selection of objects and the arrangement of objects, which is obviously key in order to bring out these kind of shared experiences or the other themes that are so important to the galleries. So, I mean, what were the strategies to help people make those links and connections. You were talking a bit about different objects that were placed side by side in one of the rooms, for example. There you can see these things right away. But if, you, if you're looking at the air raid shelter ticket, then obviously there's a bit more uh, responsibility on the viewer, on the visitor to sort of link these things. Are you helping people along with this? Do you encourage close proximity? How do you go about using objects to getting across these interpretations? You could say that the um, the way that they're linked across galleries, even if the objects are not uh, mm. directly in association with each other, is through a quite simple graphic design language of total war. So um, throughout the gallery spaces, in order to highlight this theme, we have a graphic panel that is sort of, sort of a, a ready orange colour. So the visitors can quickly identify, oh, this is a total war moment. And we use that broader term of bombing or whatever the theme might be, as I said, mobilisation it could be sexual violence, it could be famine. And we then list various different uh, examples of it across the globe to show that it was a transnational issue. You kind of get that sense of a shared experience, even though people are in different parts of the world. You're, we're focusing in on one person here. That this is the visual language that's going to help you realise that. And Kate, do you have any particular objects that are favourites of yours that perhaps reflect the global war theme or the total war theme? Yes, yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about an object which demonstrates some of the key themes of the galleries. That's, you know, this global multinational story and also clearly placing people's experiences at the heart of the displays. So the object I wanted to highlight was one that I sourced for the new galleries. And it's a helmet liner that was worn by Harry D. Evans, who was a combat medic in the US 4th Infantry Division. And he wore this helmet liner when he landed with the third wave of troops to go ashore at Utah Beach on D-Day. And Harry's object and story are displayed in a pretty large showcase that focuses on Operation Overlord. This is obviously quite a large and complex event. So I wanted to streamline what could potentially be this quite complex story and, uh, you know, aid visitors understanding of and engagement with it. So I decided pretty early on that I wanted to tell the story of D-Day from the perspective of five individuals who all went ashore that day at each of the beaches so that I could ensure that the international nature of the landings was really clear. And I found that IWM's collections had some strong stories for the two British beaches, but it had very little for the two US and the one Canadian ones. So I set about sourcing new material for those and managed to purchase a collection of uniform and equipment belonging to a US Navy officer from Omaha Beach um, at an auction, which is really great. And I also reached out to some contacts I had at museums in the US and Canada and was able to secure loan items for Juneau Beach and Utah beaches, which was really good. And I had some kind of stipulations which made it a bit tricky because they had to be a personal object that they used or wore and it had to have a photograph and they had to have gone ashore on the 6th of June, which presented some difficulties, but we got there in the end because I really wanted to create a sort of snapshot in time of what was happening on that day. So this helmet liner, it's, as I said, it's a loan item um, and it's from the West Point Museum in the US. And they also put me in contact with Harry's son, Curtis, who's been really helpful, who's been in touch. And he's provided me with a really amazing colour photo of his dad in 1944, as well as information about him for the gallery text. And Curtis is really excited about his dad's story being in the new gallery. So it was great to make that contact. And I'm really pleased that the display will feature these five different men's stories and objects. They're all really different roles on D-Day. So there is this US Army medic. There's also a US beach master. There's a British Army chaplain, a Canadian war artist, and also a British infantry soldier. So I think this will help visitors to understand that there was no single D-Day experience and that it was quite a, a vast operation that involved many different people in different roles. Absolutely. And that the army isn't just made up of soldiers as well, right. which is really yeah. interesting. And of course, the army isn't just made up of men. Um, there are lots of women's experiences. And Vicky, I think you've got an object you're quite keen to talk about as well, which helps us sort of visualise how women were involved in the war. Is that right? 
Yeah, that's right. I'd love to tell you the story um, of Louis White and her micrometer. Uh, so Louis lived in Leeds during the war and I loved reading her diaries in Ida Bloom's collection. Um, she was a huge fan of the cinema, going multiple times a week, despite often being forced to leave and find shelter during the air raids, which she was always quite frustrated about. But from December 1941, Britain conscripted women to join the war effort and women under 30 had to join the armed forces or work in the land or in the industry. And by 1943, actually, this became women up to the age of 50 who were mobilised for war work. So Louis decided to train as a milling machine operator, and she later became an inspector at the Blackburn Aircraft Factory in Leeds. She was taught how to use measuring instruments like micrometers and to draw them to scale. And when I was reading through her diaries, Louis talks about how she was eventually able to purchase her own micrometer and how her supervisor, George, engraved it for her with her name. And in her diary, she talks about how unbelievably proud she was to be promoted at this, at this role, to be in the inspector and, and to have her own set of tools. And when Louis had donated her diaries and her training notebooks to IWM, she hadn't actually donated a, the micrometer itself. And I wondered if it still existed. So I tracked down her son, Brian, and amazingly, he still had the micrometer at his home. And he was really, really pleased that we were thinking about including his mother's story in the Second World War galleries and generously sent it to us to put the micrometer on display in the new gallery spaces. And why I love the object, why I think it's absolutely fantastic is because these kind of tools would usually be associated with the work of men. But the very delicate engraving of Louis's name and the fact that it represents the new skills and experiences and, and wages and probably independence that Louis and many other women would have gained through war work means that it again harks back to that sense of total war and the mobilization of women, but also the story of, of one woman who was able to change the, the course of her life due to the events of the war. So women feature throughout the gallery spaces. We have lots of personal stories of women who were potentially, as I said, working in factories, but also that there are some women across the globe who were in the military, were fighting. There are also political activists. There are children that we include. So it's, it's key to us that their stories are told and embedded in the gallery so that you can follow them all the way through. So just staying with this, uh, this idea of different objects of different people coming together at the galleries, I guess one thing I'm curious about is how much of this material is from the, from the War Museum and how much of it comes from outside. I mean, both you and Kate have talked about objects that you tracked down, that you found that came in from the US, uh, from other parts of the UK. But you also said at the beginning that a lot of this material is already at the Imperial War Museum. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, sort of the proportions of this material and in terms of the material that came in from the outside? Are there any other objects that were particularly sort of spectacular or that were particularly difficult to track down or that you want to highlight? So the Chongqing shelter ticket from China came from the Three Gorges Museum in China and, and we're actually getting a facsimile of the object because it's so fragile and, and difficult to transport. So that is one way that we're able to put some things into the gallery, into the exhibition that we might not usually be able to obtain ourselves. The collection is, is vast and varied and has some absolutely amazing items in it. But I would say that areas relating to Asia and the Pacific and related to the Soviet Union are where we are very much more limited or we have objects of type rather than objects that have maybe a personal provenance. So uh, Kate and I have both done quite a lot of work liaising with institutions internationally, with curators to try and hunt down and identify where those gaps are so that we can make sure that we have such a diverse experience. But in some places, we've also acquired some new material, which is really exciting to be able to put into these spaces and to have within our permanent collection. One piece that I am particularly excited about is we have a, a piece of the USS Arizona, which was sunk during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 1941. During that event, they sank or damaged around eight US battleships and the attack killed over 2,400 Americans and wounded about 1,100. And over half of those killed during the whole attack on Pearl Harbor were based on the USS Arizona. So when Japanese bombs penetrated the armored deck of the Arizona, its ammunition stores exploded, ripping the battleship apart and 1,177 men were killed. Now, to have a piece of the superstructure of the battleship from the USS Arizona within IWM's permanent collection and on display is really, really important to us. It enables us to give a lot of prominence and space to this event within our galleries and also to be able to sensitively share some of the stories of those men 
who were killed on that day. It enables us to show the global nature of the story and to give prominence to what was happening in Asia and the Pacific at this time. So it's a, it's a real honour to be able to display this piece within the new galleries. And what we're seeing here is then this sort of sense of international collaboration. The IWM is interested in telling a global story. And, and I think actually either James, I can't remember whether it was James or someone at the start of the conversation, almost sort of referenced the idea that different nations have slightly owned different parts of World War II history and Holocaust history in time. And it's really interesting to see this sort of more international collaboration coming together and telling a story, I suppose, which an increasingly international set of visitors will recognise and engage with. Kate, I think you mentioned earlier that the final gallery, Gallery 6 in the World War II galleries, deals with post-conflict history a little bit. And again, that's quite global. Can you tell us about any sort of particularly interesting objects in that gallery that illustrate what people might be looking at there? Yeah, of course. As you said, we've got a, a sort of small space at the end where we do go into this post-conflict time. And it's obviously quite a broad and varied period of history, and it would have been pretty impossible to fully cover it in its entirety. So we run from 45 to 49, and I have included sort of a number of themes and events of these years from around the world. And it's split into content about the immediate aftermath of the war. So things like the war crimes trials and returning military personnel and displacement and shortages and the Allied occupation of Germany and Japan, for example. And then also content about the longer term impacts that the war had and, and sort of some of its legacies. So things like the decline in British imperial power and the spread of communism and this, the onset of the Cold War and the nuclear age. And so this is a gallery space where I've sourced and collected quite a lot of new material for display, including some really fantastic objects that are linked to the partition of India, which I was really, really happy to be able to get for display. Because we didn't have much in the collections about it, but I've acquired two items that belong to a woman named Raminda Singh, who experienced the partition. And she was married to Parkash Singh, who earned a VC during the war. Um, and they married in April of 1947, and we are displaying the really beautiful pink scarf or pallor that they wore in that wedding ceremony. And then a few months after that, because they were Sikhs, they had to leave their home in what had become Pakistan to move to a new home in northern India. And we also have on display a flat iron sort of cooking pan that was one of the few possessions that they took with them when they fled. And Raminda and Parkash, they witnessed sort of some of the bloodshed of the partition as millions of people of different religions cross this new border. And they themselves, you know, barely escaped with their lives. And it was a really dangerous time for them. And it's a really powerful story. And I think it's one that many IWM visitors will probably be unfamiliar with. I remember when we did some audience testing with this gallery text, it was really well received. And someone commented that they wouldn't have expected to see this type of story at IWM London. So it's really great to add to the collections and the displays and to tell a richer global story. Yeah, absolutely. Building up that collection so more of it is actually post-war, this sense that war doesn't end just when there's a sort of an armistice or a ceasefire. Exactly. Absolutely. Also then extending our habits of visualising war. And as James has said, with the Holocaust galleries, building connections as well between events that obviously feed into each other. I guess that brings us right to James and the Holocaust galleries. James, you were saying earlier that so far the stories of the Second World War and the Holocaust have often been told in separate ways. And as I said, uh, that's definitely something I can confirm. So talking about context, talking about which stories do we tell when we talk about a war, that's, that's something that comes up here. So I'm curious to hear more about what kind of story you are telling about the relationship between the Holocaust and World War II and how the two are related in, in this kind of new concept of the galleries that you've developed. Yeah, so I mean, we've tried to come at the subject completely afresh. Obviously, we did a lot of research. And as Alice mentioned, we, we did a lot of uh, traveling around to different museums across the world to, to, to sort of observe the way they're being presented in museums. And actually, one of the things that we noticed is that definitely been some quite uh, obvious tropes, uh, frankly, had kind of crept into the museology. So, so we were quite aware of that. We didn't want to sort of rail against that just a, as an end in itself. We wanted to sort of go back to basics and think, what is it that we're trying to achieve here? And ultimately, the, the answer is that we want visitors to understand that this is a history that happened in our world. 
And it took what Carl Schlerness quite a long time ago described as a twisting path, that there's been a real tendency within public understanding of the Holocaust to really sort of synthesize this complex process into something which is uh, extremely teleological. And we've tried to really sort of push against that. So from the get-go, one of the things that we'll notice entering our galleries is they're quite bright spaces. By uh, convention, Holocaust galleries have always been quite dark spaces because obviously that speaks to the nature of the subject. But unfortunately, it also starts to consolidate ongoing myths about the Holocaust as being something that was somehow kind of clandestine and happened in the shadows. And I think Alice, this really speaks to the point that you were saying earlier about the dialogue between museums and public understanding. That, that's clearly quite an active process. I think it also suggests to visitors that they're, they're the only sort of appropriate response is silence. You know, this Julian Rose talked a while ago about the idea of Holocaust piety. And of course, respect for the subject is, is critical, but it's also important, I think, that people feel empowered to ask questions because that's obviously how we nurture understanding. So the, the spaces are not dark for that reason. And we follow a very chronological narrative. That said, one of the things that we've tried to do to the extent that we're able to is to uncouple narratives of persecuting and being persecuted. There's, there's a real uh, palpable tendency within Holocaust museology and Holocaust historiography to tell the history from the perspective of the perpetrators and to reduce the people that were being persecuted to sort of narrative devices. And, and that's something we were really actively trying to resist. So in the new galleries, the first thing that was to see before they enter a space about, you know, the Nazis and Hitler, et cetera, is, is a space about Jewish people as a pluralistic, diverse group, groups of people, different communities, different identities across Europe, living very different lives, but not mediated by their existence as a persecuted group by the Nazis. Moving forward, we've tried to sort of unpack the so-called causal nexus of the Holocaust. So not to suggest the Holocaust is a product of a sort of a monocausal dialogue between anti-Semitism and Nazism or book burning. So James, we've heard from Vicky and Kate about some of the guiding principles underlining their storytelling in the World War II galleries. But can you just highlight a couple of the key principles that guided the storytelling which you and, and the Holocaust team wanted to do in the Holocaust galleries? Um, I think as much to bust myths as to explain events to visitors. Um, we try to look at the way that all these things work in dialogue with each other, creating a situation which kind of amplified and evolved. One of the things that we noticed, again, these things were always separated out. We also try to look a little bit more actively at the idea of the so-called consensus dictatorship. So this is obviously something which has come out a lot more in the historiography in the last kind of few years, to say that within Germany, a lot of people participated in the, actively in the Reich in the pre-war years, not necessarily because they were virulently anti-Semitic, but because it was in their own interest to do so. You know, there, were, there was jobs and opportunity and economic um, upside to, to acquiescing to the regime. So to be clear about the fact that the Nazi regime wasn't enforced through the pernicious use of force, which I think is probably something which is still quite active for me in the public consciousness as a kind of an ongoing myth. So it sounds like unpicking long established habits of visualising the Holocaust has obviously been really key to your approach. And you've also talked about how important it was to contextualise the Holocaust and not have it floating free from history. So can you tell us just a bit more about how the new galleries explain the complex connections between World War II and the Holocaust? And perhaps also how you draw attention to just how improvised and unplanned things were at times. Yeah, so I mean, the idea that the movement towards war, to speak to your, to your point about the relationship between the war and the Holocaust, even at that early stage, so the, the implementation of the four-year plan by Goering means that the Nazis need a lot more money than they've got. So they start to look at the Jewish communities across the, the growing Reich, and they start to look at processes of Aryanization, of taxation, of economically exploiting uh, Jewish people. We look at the, the November pogroms, Christian Nazis, as we used to call it, um, and, and that is a kind of a significant escalation of violence and tension. And the Anschluss too, of course, you know, really important as a contingent history. The Anschluss is, is a meaningful step forward in terms of persecution of Jewish people than the Reich. You know, what happens in Vienna is even something of a shock to the Nazis in Berlin at the time, you know, to see this sort of public outpouring of violence in the streets. And then moving forward to the war, obviously, policies of ghettoization begin quite early on. And ghettos, I think, are a, a really misunderstood part of Holocaust historiography within the public consciousness, particularly within museums too, I think. The idea that, because history tells us that ghettos became sort of staging points for the implementation of the final solution from late 1941 into 1942 onwards. That's not, not necessarily how they're conceived in the first instance. And that's certainly not how they were experienced by people who were forced to live within them. So we're trying to look at the, you know, the ghettos as this sort of evolution of a policy which didn't have a kind of predetermined end point. Obviously, you know, 
uh, Hitler was imagining a world without Jews, but hasn't really confirmed how he's hoping to achieve that, and not as Heydrich or Himmler or, uh, or any of the other inner circle. But very importantly for us too, is to identify the ways in which the invasion of the Soviet Union becomes a crucial turning point in respect of Nazi anti-Jewish policy. So, of course, uh, the Wehrmacht are followed by, by four Einsatzgruppen divisions, and that is a rapid escalation of anti-Jewish violence. So uh, we move from uh, you know, the Nazis shooting, um, not just the Nazis, but collaborators, of course, across Central and Eastern Europe, uh, shooting uh, military-aged men to shooting women and children in, in a matter of weeks. And of course, again, really importantly, this thing is led by highly educated men. And again, I think that's something which visitors will be quite surprised by. There's the sense that somehow the people doing these things are kind of brainwashed, hyper-radicalised, no sense of agency, no idea about what they're doing. They're almost just sort of robots. Of course, it's not true. You know, we look at the, the fact that these answers group and commanders, you know, there's, there's doctorates across the spectrum. You then have the situation where you have uh, ghettos operating at the same time as the answers group are operating. So, you know, Jews in certain parts of um, occupied Europe are forced to live in, albeit in terrible conditions, but, you know, elsewhere, people are being shot in snitches. And then in Western Europe, the situation is completely different again. So it's, it's much more complex, much less kind of um, synthesized than a lot of people might necessarily think. Then, of course, at the end of 1941, the Japanese decision to bomb Pearl Harbor is obviously something which has a massive impact on Jewish people living in Central and Eastern Europe, because it means the Nazis know that they're going to be in the war for a lot longer. They suddenly think they've lost their imagined bargaining chip with Jews in America, and that there's no reason for them to keep Jews, and also no practical ability for them to keep Jews within ghettos. So, so then they, they move towards this policy of mass extermination. And then, of course, as we move forward, we're really trying hard to avoid the idea that the Holocaust is somehow being the apotheosis of industrialized genocide. You know, I think that really takes the Nazis at their own word to allow this. Uh, ongoing myth that somehow this was a perfectly organized, well-oiled, bureaucratic machine that took people and processed their debts. Of course, that's not how it was at all. It was infinitely more messy, brutal, barbaric, improvised than that. And we've tried to really contextualize that and then also separate out death camps and concentration camps. So I think if you ask a lot of people about the Holocaust, they talk to you about concentration camps. And of course, in many respects, the concentration camps are relatively peripheral to narratives of the Holocaust, certainly until the middle part of the war. When we're talking about camps, quote unquote, earlier in the war, we're talking about death camps, we're talking about discrete places thrown together in occupied Eastern Europe where people are, are sent off and killed in 45 minutes to two hours. There's no selection, there's no hope of being saved. And it's important for us to be really, really clear about that. But then also to be clear about how concentration camps come into the narrative. And of course, again, that's related to the causes of the war because of course the Germans are starting to lose the war quite badly on the Eastern Front. They need ammunition, they need people to make the ammunition, they need building projects. And so they do what would have been completely inconceivable a few years before, and they look to the remaining Jews that are alive. So this is where concentration camps come into the mix. And then by 1944, of course, you get this explosion of concentration camps across Europe, and you also get Hungary, which is a really important thing for our narrative to be clear about the fact that when the Nazis occupy Hungary, and we separated this out in our narrative to try and sort of contextualize this properly, They've lost the war. Obviously, there are still some senior members of the Wehrmacht who think that somehow, you know, Hitler's going to pull something out of the bag. But nevertheless, most of them understand the fact that war is lost. And nevertheless, they invade Hungary in a matter of three months, deport more Jewish people than they ever have. And, and of course, this is when Auschwitz comes into the, the middle of the narrative. Of course, Auschwitz has been there before, but 437,000 Jews deported to Auschwitz in three months. Gas chambers become so overrun at Auschwitz, they have to start burning people in pits, the crematoria can't handle the number of bodies. And um, they build the ram within the death gates. So all of these, these popular images we have of the Holocaust, of the, and we try and really explain this to visitors. These things happened at a moment in time. This idea of selections on the ramp at Auschwitz, which really dominates a lot of people's understanding, was actually a really anomalous moment. It only happened for a very short period of time because of a very specific set of circumstances. But what's really important for us, and this is where we talk about people like Raoul Wallenberg and Karl Lutz and the international rescue operations that happened at that time, because the information about what the Nazis were doing to Europe's Jews at that stage had become so widely understood and so public. What you just said there really testifies to how important it is that museums like the Imperial War Museum regularly refresh the way that we narrate and view events like the Holocaust. As you say, most of us have these really iconic images in our minds, which we think represent the whole story, but which actually only tell one part of it and, and don't reflect the, the complexity of events as they unfolded. 
So there's an important adjustment of our habits of visualizing war there. And I think you continue this with the stories that you tell of how camps were liberated, the various rescue missions that went on, and how you actually go about narrating the end of the Holocaust. Is that right? Yeah, so I mean, the international diplomats are flying in and openly negotiating to save Jewish lives. And of course, that completely displaces the myth about the fact that nobody knew what was happening. We know that obviously two years before the Allies had a very good idea what was going on. But at this stage, it's so open that it's being openly negotiated. And this is where the, the relationship between the war and the Holocaust gets really kind of dynamic. It's almost as if the Nazis at this stage think we're going to lose the geopolitical strategic war against the Allies, but we can still try and win our imagined war against the Jews, because there's no way really of making sense of the fact that they continue with this when they know that they're going to have to answer for the consequences. The Allies are sending out messages at this stage, and we talk about this saying, we know what you're doing, we can see what you're doing, you will be brought to justice for it, and they do it anyway. So we bring that narrative through to that point, we look at the relationship between these two things, then we of course we look at the final phase of the war, some of the recent research about the very final phase of the concentration camps, being really clear about the fact that some of the imagery that comes out of places like Belsom, which has really come sort of dominates aesthetics of the Holocaust, again, is quite misleading because Belsom wouldn't have looked like that at all for the vast majority of its existence. You know, that testifies to the fact that the wheels have completely come off the Reich. And then, you know, liberation, the complexity of liberation, it's not a triumphalist narrative. It's, you know, a lot of, of survivors talk about the emptiness that they experienced the second that they were liberated. And then the, the challenge which they have as soon as they're liberated, of what we describe as surviving survival in the gallery. So rather than finishing as we currently do around about 1945, 1946, try and take the narrative forward through the process of being displaced persons, trying to find somewhere to go, trying to survive somewhere to exist, the challenge that they experienced, the problems of justice, how do you encode something like this, you know, in international law and international law that didn't exist before the war and had to be created. And then also we finish then with what happens after that. So we try and bring our narrative right up to the present day with the idea of, you know, the legacies of these things as things which continue to affect lives. In fact, as I speak to you, we have be recording interviews with, with second and third generations to, to try and make sure that we contextualise those narratives within the gallery as well. So try and sort of suggest that the complexity of that and try and be really clear about the fact that in the final space that over and above all else, the Holocaust is a narrative of annihilation. And in the final space, in fact, we have a type-in that belonged to a gentleman called Mark Kellerman, who, who came to this country in 1938, deposited this type in a bracelet at a branch of Barclays Bank, and then went back to Bratislava. It was never heard of again. He never came to reclaim the objects. And Barclays held onto the objects for a period of time, tried to trace them, and they couldn't. And eventually they gave them to us. They were the only two unclaimed objects they had from that time. They gave them to us. We tried to trace them and couldn't find them either. We can't find anything about him. And for us, that's a really important way of finishing our narrative to say ultimately within this history there are vast unknowable dimensions and, and we need to be really open and really clear about that we can't hope and we're not suggesting that we could we can't hope to tell a complete narrative there isn't one to be told and it's important we're clear with visitors about that as they leave the space I'm really enthusiastic to hear about this because this is completely prompting me at least to rethink how I've been conceptualizing the relationship between the Holocaust and World War II. Is this? I mean, there's so much in there clearly about the dynamics between these two. I also find quite interesting that you made a similar choice to the World War II exhibition by not stopping with the liberation, but then looking forward also to understand what happens after because these stories, you know, they never end the official end point. We'll talk about the power of stories a little more, a little further on, and I definitely have a few follow-up questions also on narratives and how narratives are created and how iconic moments create narratives of entire events, how narratives are then instrumentalized by people, but also the question of narrative and responsibility. So I guess there's definitely something we want to come back to. I'm just wondering whether, uh, James, you could tell us a bit more about those objects that you're using, because they're clearly also important in your, your galleries, and you mentioned the title writer and can you tell us a bit more about this kind of material aspect of the exhibition? I mean obviously from our point of view the Imperial War Museum did formally collect around the subjects of the Holocaust until relatively recently. As it happens there were a number of objects within the collections that were actually related to the Holocaust but they weren't collected with that in mind. For example there's a bogey from Mittel Baldora uh, V2 uh, factory, a bogey that used to hold a V2, and it was collected as an object about the V2. And obviously we would come to it as contemporary curators and say, well, actually, this is about the Holocaust as well, because it was they were used by slave labourers in, in, in underground tunnels. But essentially, the museum didn't have an awful lot. So they started collecting for the current exhibition in the uh, 19... 
90s and that's been an ongoing effort but as Alice mentioned before we've been entirely beholden to international institutions for the purposes of assembling the objects for these collections but of course for us there, there is a really big question about what objects we should be using and what we're doing with those objects I think obviously aligned with the kind of museum's broader direction we, we try to use objects as kind of holders of narrative rather than just kind of details to the side so when we're shaping and structuring the narrative that we were seeking to tell we tried to make sure that each object was there for a reason that it had a kind of a function so the way that the captions are written integrate the object into a narrative and they speak to various dimensions the one that I always think of as being probably the most sort of symbolic that we have but also really important is a, a millstone that was recovered from eastern Europe that was made from Jewish headstone from a graveyard and there's still discernible Hebrew on the headstone and as part of this project we, we got in touch with a few different people because we'd never been able to get it transcribed and spoke to a rabbi up in North London who transcribed it for us and he said the remaining pieces of visible text on the gravestone say for these I weep, my eyes, my eyes are shedding tears. And I just thought as a single object, it's kind of incredible because it speaks to genocide, not just mass murder, but genocide, the attempt to completely obliterate a culture, you know, which, which, which is completely encoded in, in the idea of ransacking and trying to destroy a graveyard. And yet this thing has somehow existed through being repurposed and still speaks to, to the people that previously used it to speaks to the life that the Nazis tried to eradicate. But it also testifies to the sort of the unknowableness because we don't know any more about it. There's not enough on it to tell us who it came from. So we don't even know which graveyard it might come from. There's no name. But nevertheless, the, as I say, the Nazis' genocidal intent was to eradicate not just Jewish people, but Jewish culture and Jewish religion. And yet this persists and it speaks to that whole narrative. So for me, that's really, really important. I think the other thing for, for us in terms of objects and materiality is that because of the way that the Holocaust has been sort of absorbed within contemporary culture as this kind of this limit case, this ethical limit case, particularly with respect to spaces like the gas chambers, sometimes it's quite useful to remind people that they weren't these sort of spaces of the negative sublime. They were actually just buildings, quite low tech buildings, actually. And so, you know, in certain moments in the galleries, if, if we've got pieces of the gas chambers in various forms there was a big kind of ethical concern for us we didn't want to kind of present these things as some sort of death relics or you know anything kind of uh, that would indulge that slightly kind of purian interest in mass murder but to say actually the gas chambers were just rooms that had tiles and walls and ceilings and pipes and the nazis pushed people in they switched on a stolen soviet engine they killed them and then they dragged them out that was it. And they just did it on a huge scale. It's not as if somehow, you know, when we're speaking to designers about the project, there was almost this sort of weird mythical fascination with these sort of certain types of spaces. And we wanted to try and strip all of that away. And so for us, objects really helped to do that as well, because being confronted with their really basic materiality helps to reintegrate these things into our world and say this was people killing people it wasn't some strange thing that we drifted into some parallel dimension or reality where people were different and then, then there's some sort of specific thing that occurred it was just people that killed people and this is how they did it and so we tried to make sure our objects were working quite hard to do that. And I think that goes back to something you were saying earlier, James, about sort of pushing back against these established narratives that perhaps other exhibitions, other history and historical accounts have told, which have somehow given us the impression that the Holocaust was a sort of incredible kind of technological, technologically complex and sophisticated almost. And this focus on the mundaneness of just the very basic poor quality tiles in the gas chamber, for example, really helps push back against that and as you say focus on the people doing things to people and not on the technology so much and I think you've wrestled a little bit as well with the ethics of using photographs by perpetrators is that right is that something you've talked about so obviously there's this huge challenge uh, relating to the use of photographs in, in relation to this subject the second world war ii of course but in the first instance the, the photos are perpetrated to right you know this is this is a, an act of perpetration and of course in some respects by using these images we are po participants in re-perpetrating because you know we're further using these these objects of perpetration and of course the people in them and that you know this runs the full spectrum from the early years of the regime right through to you know some of the most despicable things that the nazis were doing and, and photos of mass shootings and that kind of stuff and so 
we spoke to our advisory board a lot about it and we consulted quite widely on it too because we were thinking on one hand are we sidestepping the issue by not using these images because you know they do have an evidential function but on the other by using them are we as I say re-perpetrating but also kind of in some respects disrespecting the people who are in them because we couldn't ask them and it's I think it's dangerous to make too many assumptions but I think uh, my, my sense is that people in those images wouldn't want to be seen like that and that's a real challenge for us so Interestingly, our advisory board were quite mixed. We spoke to a lot of consultation groups who were much more actually in favour of using the imagery. But one of the things which we were really mindful of is not using the imagery as a means of sort of precipitating a, an emotional reaction. So not using to sort of shock people. So not to sort of manipulate a response and engineer people suffering for kind of contemporary emotional response. And so, so what we tried to do is to, in fact, we were talking to a scholar in the University of Nottingham who's been really brilliant, but she reminded me through her work that when these images were used contemporaneously, they would have been printed at relatively small sizes because the people who took the photos would have anticipated seeing them at those relatively small sizes. The idea that we would, you know, blow them up into huge graphics now is not something that would have been in their mind as they were taken. And of course, that seems like an obvious thing to say, but it, it does kind of change the way you think about them a little. So, so what we've done with our imagery is, is, is always try to use them where we're using that type of imagery at the original size and not to try to do anything to sort of fetishize or to uh, to elevate, just, just to position them and to narrativize them. But what we've also done is we, we have a text device, which we call MetaTexts, which are an opportunity for us to sort of directly bring visitors into these questions and to say, you know, there is a question mark about these type of images and this is the argument why and this is the argument against and this is what we've done. So that at least, you know, I think, you know, you won't want to do it too much because it, there's a danger that becomes indulgent if we try to bring visitors into every single decision that we're making. But I think in respect to some of these really big issues, it's important that the visitors are aware of these things. And so we are at least reflexive in, in the choices that we're making. So, so that's what we've done with those things. It's a difficult one. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of the fact that people come to the exhibition will, will have different opinions about it. I wonder whether I can ask a little bit more about this, uh, the, the, these different narratives and the, what we are interested in is this also this feedback loop in terms of, you know, what, what kind of effect does the narrative have? How does it prompt people to think and rethink the things that they think they know? I mean, that's at the heart of both the World War II exhibition and the Holocaust galleries. One thing, James, that you were saying earlier that really struck me was this idea of the link between the story of the Holocaust as a highly technological process and the Nazi version of the Holocaust, which is obviously very prominent. And I, I guess Eichmann, that was his story in a way that he told in Jerusalem, I was just this little cock, I was just doing my job. And you know, this was this big machine. And it's the only way you know, you could do these things. So there's there's a direct link here between the story that we accept about the events and where this comes from and the question of responsibility in a way, because obviously this kind of story, this is a technological machine, that's an exculpatory story, right? So there's a lot there to think about in terms of responsibility that's bound up with the kind of story we're telling about these events, is that right? Yeah, absolutely right. And I always find it so striking that there is still a tendency to take Eichmann at his word. You know, Eichmann is trying to defend himself for his life in court. And so he makes up an account, which, as you say, is ex three from his point of view. And we all take it at face value. And there has been a tendency to do so. And I think this is one of the things we try and confront, actually, really actively in the gallery, is exactly this issue, this issue of agency uh, on both sides of the paradigm, you know, for agency of people doing it, but also the people experiencing it, because they weren't, you know, this idea of quote unquote lambs to the slaughter became really prevalent as well. And of course, that's not true either. But I think in respect of perpetrators, you know, Christopher Browning was telling us in the 1980s, to the best of my knowledge, this remains true, that there was a single documented case of, of a German Nazi being disciplined for refusing to participate. And of course, some of them did, and, and they were just moved on to other jobs and stuff. So it was possible to refuse to participate. And also it's possible to choose to participate and to do it for various different reasons. That's a complex process, but nevertheless, it's there. The other thing for us, which was really important, which we've tried to lay out quite clearly in the design, is that kind of actual historiography over the last 10, 15 years or so, but it's, so the relationship between the, the center and the periphery. So to be really clear about the fact that, you know, there is a kind of an engine of decision-making coming from, you know, the bear cough, Berlin from, from the Hitler in the inner circle. But there is also agency on the ground. And I think that the idea that Sigmund Bauman was pushing some years ago that, that somehow the Holocaust was just about modernity and somehow once the process gets going, then it just develops this momentum. Obviously, and historians have kind of broadly disproved that, but I think some, some remnant of this idea persists that it was a machine and that everyone involved in it was kind of observing the machine. And I think in some respects, that's the most dangerous assumption that anybody could form because of course it wasn't a machine. It was individuals making decisions and continuing make, to make decisions to push this thing forward. And responsibility is aggregated across a vast 
volume of different people within that. And so if we're talking about the answer script, we could say, well, you know, the orders come from Heydrich and Himmler and Hitler, obviously, to, to, to do what they're doing. But of course, on the ground, they have an awful lot of agency in, in deciding to do what they're doing as well. One of the things I was really struck by going to a lot of Holocaust museums, actually, is that you very rarely see Hitler and Himmler and Heydrich once the narrative gets going, because they're not really there, you know, by design, they're to the side, kind of pushing orders through. And we try to make sure, actually, that they did remain, you know, in the centre of it and having some sort of ownership of what they're doing, but also being clear about the fact that Eichmann's defence is untenable, you know, because I think that's the danger too. I think taking at their words, it comes too easy to say that, to say, oh, you know, all that the Isis Griffin were doing was following orders and they had no choice and God, you know, it's not their fault, which was not true too. So we, so we try to be quite clear about that and identify, you know, Nazis across the spectrum, but also not just Nazis. The other thing, of course, which is really uncomfortable and, and difficult is that all of this relied on active participation. And not just from people wearing uniforms. That's really tricky too. That, of course, in the sort of the middle part of the process, civil servants and railway workers and factory, all these different people involved in this process, they've been completely anonymous. So, like when we were trying to do some research to give some examples of who these people were, it was virtually impossible. We were talking to scholars and so working in this field, and they were saying you won't find photos of them because they were allowed to just disappear back into society afterward. They were completely anonymous because they, they weren't at the top of the hierarchy and they weren't the ones on the ground doing the killing. They were just facilitating it in the middle. I'm not talking about like car carrying Nazis here necessarily, or certainly not uniform wearing people. I'm talking about huge volumes of people in between. And we've tried to do something to open up that as well to suggest quite how many people were involved in this because you can't kill six million people with a small group in a hidden forest in eastern Europe it just doesn't work that way. There are lots of overlaps clearly in the storytelling approach but also the research approach and the principles between the new holocaust galleries and the world war ii galleries this interest in telling the total story in using individual stories and exploring the diversity of experience the way in which current really contemporary research has fed in very clearly into both the holocaust galleries and the world war ii galleries just picking up on a couple of the things you've been saying there james about agency and so on. We've been talking a lot about the Holocaust and of course that's actually a term that is quite abstract in some ways. You've also mentioned the word genocide a couple of times which does attribute agency and a little bit more I think sometimes but I think it's right to say isn't it that you don't actually use the terms Holocaust or genocide in the exhibition itself because those words weren't used at the time and you're again taking this contemporary approach which is also what the World War II galleries are doing but at the end you do prompt visitors you know, like the World War II galleries, you look beyond the Holocaust, beyond the liberation, and you do prompt visitors to think about how terms like genocide and so on actually came into being with the trials at Nuremberg and so on. Um, so I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about that, about how you narrate the end. You've mentioned a tiny bit of it already, but can you talk us through a bit more? You're absolutely right. We, we don't use the word Holocaust and we don't use the word genocide because, because they're not contemporaneous. And actually, in some respects, the word Holocaust has almost become a, a, a bit of a problem, I think, in terms of public understanding, because it completely kind of encodes something which is vast and sprawling into something kind of quite you know neat and tidy and complete, which is, which is quite erroneous. And of course, that's not how it was at the time. It is a post-war uh, way of describing it, or broadly, you know, of course, there are examples of it being used through the war, but essentially in terms of its, you know, encodement as a sort of a singularly recognised reference. In terms of genocide, yeah, we, we've been really grateful to have had the assistance of Professor Philippe Sands on, on this part of the project, who's obviously done uh, an extraordinary amount of work on international law, and he advised us on the work of Lemkin and Lauterpacht in the post-war trials. And so we tried to include information about how the terms genocide and crimes against humanity become formalised part of international law at this stage. Of course, you know, there isn't then a huge hiatus between this sort of wide scale application, or, you know, right to the 1990s. But nevertheless, I think we when we think of, of the notion of genocide as somehow being kind of eternal, and maybe that's just me, but I built you know, something that just always been understood, you know, that these things are always being sort of formalised as crimes. And I think that it was really important for us to say, actually, no, what, you know, what happened is that after the war, there were these, as Churchill called them, these crimes without a name, and it, and it required people to come together and give them names and to formalise them. And, and genocide is used inaccurately quite a lot, actually, in, in contemporary society, a lot and in the you know in the press too and, and to say genocide isn't of a synonym for mass murder it's something else as well it's about the attempt to eradicate a group of people and so it was important to us to be able to explain that to be able to say this this word came to be because one individual looked at what had happened historically of course in Lemkin's case tragically Lemkin started to think about this word before the war and it ended up being the word that described the murder of his own family 
and then it's used it in Nuremberg in 46, you know, within the statutes, it's not, it's not a charge in and of itself, it's, but within the stretch, but nevertheless, it means this whole notion of international justice and international law, as we understand it today, comes from here. So we're displaying a graphic repro of the scribbles on the piece of paper where Lemkin's, I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary thing to see. You can see him arriving at the word genocide, but also being quite clear about as in something which Philippe feels very strongly about about the fact that it's not the only way of describing these things, you know, crimes against humanity, i.e., you know, the responsibility of the individual, the responsibility of the group and the state or towards the group and the state, etc. is it's an important dimension. So, yeah, that, that's the hope. And, and, and similarly with Holocaust in the final space, we say it's come to be known as Holocaust in this country and in other parts of the world, but, but not everywhere. You know, of course, in, in other parts of the world, again, it's known as the shower. Essentially, we're already talking about wider contexts now that are even wider than the context within the galleries and the exhibitions. So I, I guess I have a question for all three of you. So how do these new galleries sort of connect to the wider museum's exploration of conflict from World War I to the present day? Yeah, I think the new galleries, they really they build on what we've started with the, this transforming project where, um, you know, the, the World War One galleries. And that's what the museum does, really. It, it, our remit is obviously wars of the, since 1914, but it's really history of the 20th century, now the 21st century. And um, so I think, yeah, what, what we do is we we explore conflict. It impacted people's lives in millions and millions of people's lives. And, you know, we, we cover sort of the biggest events of the 20th century and, and we show how they, you know, that they didn't just finish when, when the, the guns fell silent, but they had these sort of ripple effects, which were, you know, really huge. Um, and I think that that's something which binds them all together is that we, we take these big events, these big sort of difficult maybe to, to grasp events, and we, we do take them down to that personal level. So, you know, it can, you can explain something like, oh, the, you know, the, the bombing campaign happened and this many bombs were dropped. But until you really distill it down to, oh, this is a person who was in a bombing air, bomb aircraft. This is a person who was on the ground in, in Germany, say, you know, part of the air raid precautions. This is how civilians reacted. This is how it meant for them. You don't really get a sense of what that larger event was until you really take it down to the personal. I think that's something which visitors hopefully will connect with and understand as they go through our galleries, um, that they'll they'll empathise with people. And I, I know I certainly do when I read these stories and I've been researching the stories that go into the galleries. And when I look at the other ones, the First World War galleries and the Holocaust is, you can't help but put yourself in their shoes as far as you can do um, to empathise and to try and understand these events, which, you know, luckily, fortunately, we, we are not living through and can't really grasp and grapple with. But I think that's what those personal stories do. And all three of you in different ways have talked about the fact that you've actually been in conversation with second, third generation, you know, the, the sons of people who own the micrometer or third generations who, of people who've survived surviving the Holocaust and so on. And that really, in a sense, I think, Vicky, you mentioned earlier that we don't any longer have necessarily the grannies who survived World War I or the grandpas touring us around anymore. But it seems to me that the museum is maintaining those personal contacts in a way which is keeping those personal stories going. Vicky, earlier you mentioned as one of the things that you look at in the Second World War galleries as part of the total war approach, you mentioned sexual violence as one of the things that you look at. That really struck me because it made me realise that I suppose I associate sexual violence with 21st century or late 20th century conflict and I'd never in the past actually thought about it in the context particularly of World War II because my image of World War II is very much about the Blitz and uh, so I found that interesting and it seemed to me that one of the things that you're doing there is uh, is helping us recontextualize World War II um, and, and, and contemporary conflicts through each other somehow that, you, you know, putting them in dialogue with each other is one of the things that, that the Imperial War Museums is doing. Yeah, I think that's correct. And I think um, as curators, what we are trying to do within these gallery spaces is to, we can never give a, a definitive narrative of, of the Second World War, um, although we, we try to give it, you know, as, as much as possible. We know that we can't include everybody's story and, and every instance of, of total war, but we want to provide our visitors with opportunities to be challenged and to question what they know or what they maybe associate with the Second World War and what they don't, so that they could potentially go away and explore those details further. So as for the total war element on sexual violence, um, 
the case study that we we look at, although we describe sexual violence across armies, across continents, um, and, and show that it was uh, prevalent in, in many different cases throughout the Second World War, we focus in on um, what was happening to the sexual slavery of Japanese so-called comfort women and the, the forced sexual slavery of, of women who were in these areas, mostly Chinese, Korean and Japanese women, although there were others from some of the occupied areas. And we have a sign from a comfort station that was collected from Burma. And we'll be putting that on display to use as our object to explore this narrative. And we also have a personal story of some somebody who was treated as a comfort woman. So we think it's really important to have some of these potentially sometimes marginalised stories within the gallery and highlighted to challenge our visitors to consider the, the different aspects of history. And James, what do you hope the visitors to the Holocaust Gallery will take away in terms of rethinking conflict more broadly and in terms of thinking more about the role and the place of the Holocaust within modern history more broadly? The first thing for me would be uh, we will have done our jobs if people leave the galleries thinking I'd never thought about it like that before. I had a sense of this thing called the Holocaust and I thought I knew what it was about based on having you know seen a couple of films or you know maybe read something but I've never thought about it like that before. That would that would be you know a sign that we'd, we'd kind of done our jobs right. The second part is a slightly more complex thing which is I think that sometimes there's assumptions around Holocaust pedagogy at least that in order to kind of quote unquote make sense of the Holocaust you have to sort of look outward to see what happened here and then map that onto that. I think for me actually it's more important to look inwards I think in order to look outwards you, you have to first look within and I find myself thinking in respect of how we think about ourselves and the relationship of this to history uh, by way of an anecdote um, one of the questions that students ask us quite a lot when they when they hear about accounts of pre-war Jewish life they say to us uh, I don't understand why didn't they all just leave and our answer to that obviously again is quite complicated but to me the, the most simple answer to that question is because the holocaust hadn't happened the reason that you're asked the reason that you've even said that is because you haven't realized the extent to which your outlook on the world has been conditioned by the knowledge that this thing happened within the, the center of western culture in the 20th century and I think that's the thing which is really important to become aware of that fact is to become aware of the fact that this represents a paradigmatic shift in our sense of ourselves and to engage with what that means because I think the tendency has always been to say you know be scared of this history you know because you because you could have been a victim of it and I don't think enough we say well hang on a second who was doing it because we were pretty similar to them as well and I think these questions are the ones that we need to be asking ourselves what is it within us that makes this possible because it's not to the side. We always think of it as being something, you know, completely aberrant within Western culture. That's not right. It didn't happen despite who we are. It happened because this is who we are. And I think that's the, the most important thing to engage with, with this Holocaust historiography. And I think that's the thing which I really hope that the visitors get uh, as they come around and, and, and remains with them afterwards to continue to ask themselves that question. And that very much speaks to what you said earlier, James, about the sense that often there's an approach of sort of piety, reverence and respect when you go into a museum that's um, discussing the Holocaust. But one of the things that you want to do is empower people to ask those very, very uncomfortable questions. And that's also come out very much in your discussion, Kate and Vicky, of the World War II galleries. And I think, you know, one of the things that all three of you have given us a fantastic virtual tour of these galleries, you know, I think one of the things that sort of in a way represents them really well for me is, Kate, you mentioned earlier the V1 flying bomb that's suspended actually between the World War II and the Holocaust galleries is this sort of striking symbol of how the Holocaust and the Second World War were interconnected. So it's one of sort of 10,000 of these sort of doodle bugs that, of course, we associate with the Blitz were launched at London and other British cities and killed thousands of people so they're really remembered as part of Britain's war but of course the V1 bomber was part of Holocaust history thousands of camp prisoners laboring in these appalling conditions made these weapons in Nazi Germany and just flipping that one object in different ways is something that starts people in the process of asking new questions and and becoming I suppose aware of what we still don't know and our, our habits our very ingrained habits of visualizing the Second World War and indeed the Holocaust. I'm really excited that from today onwards visitors are able to visit these galleries in person. I'm very much looking forward to doing so myself.
thank you very, very much for coming on the podcast and giving us this insight into them and getting us thinking really so about the power of storytelling, museums as places that tell stories, that counter established stories as well. Yes, I, I certainly can't wait to go to London and visit the galleries. And I can also say for myself, just the conversation today has made me rethink a lot of things that I thought I knew about these things and uh, how they all hang together. So thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. I was also impressed to learn more about the planning and the intellectual work that goes into creating such an exhibition space. I think that would be very interesting also to our listeners because that's normally not something that you see on display in the exhibition itself. As well as visiting the new World War II and Holocaust galleries, you can also buy a book edited by Kate and Vicky and uh, some of their colleagues, Total War, A People's History of World War II, if you want to start uh, digging into all of this before you have a chance to uh, visit the, the galleries themselves. The book is, it really builds on what's in the galleries, because obviously writing text for a, an exhibition, you're very constrained as to how, my, how many word counts you have. So we've really been able to sort of use that as a basis, what we've included in the exhibition, and then really build on that and sort of flesh out the details, provide more information. So you'll find lots of the objects that are on display in the galleries are also in the book. There's lots of great pictures and also lots of the people's stories. And we're able to tell often a more complete story of that person because we've got the, the, the scope to do so. I know I, I sort of wrote too much in many places and had to cut it down, but um, we, we've got a, yeah, we've got there in the end with this book, which really kind of guides you through. And there's also, it features infographics throughout, which help to show how and where the war was fought and how it impacted people's lives around the world. So another contribution to rethinking, revisualizing World War II there. Thank you also to you, our listeners, for tuning in again. Please do join us again next week when we'll be joined by another expert on World War II, Professor Julian Wright. Julian's research looks at how people during the Second World War tried to retain or rebuild their sense of time while living through circumstances that really disrupted that and challenged their conceptions of past and future. So Julian's work shines a light on a really fascinating and important aspect of war studies, So next week's episode will round off the little mini series that we've been running on different ways of visualizing the two world wars. And we really hope you're going to be able to join us and listen in. If you'd like to support our project, please do share and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or whatever platform you use so you don't miss an episode. And please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. And if you'd like to join the conversation further, you can follow us on social media. Just search for Visualising War or get in touch directly by emailing us at viswar at standrews.ac.uk. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young and the show was mixed by Sophia Gertin. Thank you all for listening.